Welcome to this new thinking for a new world podcast of the Talberg Foundation. Modern slavery, how do we end it? Why does slavery persist in 130 countries worldwide? Where will the moral leadership come from to end this multi-billion dollar annual global trade? Alan Stoga talks to Sunita Krishnan, the co-founder of Prashwala, an organization that rescues, rehabilitates and reintegrates sex traffic victims into society, and a Talberg Alliance and Global Leadership Prize laureate about these and other questions. Sunitha, we've had many conversations over the years about many things, but most importantly, human trafficking. I've seen estimates that there could be as many as 20, 40, maybe even more million people in modern slavery today. Trafficking is obviously an abomination. Why does it persist? It persists for various reasons. And one of the things is the is a lack of will, uh, lack of political will globally and locally to end this problem. There's one end, the demand for human beings for exploiting somebody else that is increasing absolutely astronomically because the increase is not for adult human beings that one is looking at. More and more little children are preferred and uh, uh, especially human slavery for commercial sexual exploitation is perhaps becoming one of the biggest organized crime in the world. And um, globally, you will see a sense of impunity everywhere in the world. Um, in countries which have more vulnerable communities, which has more poverty, which has more more reasons for people to be in desperate situation, uh, the situation is far, far more grim. But I must say uh, more than 130 countries have the same problem. The rich countries are also not spared. It means the demand for uh, exploitation is not just something that is related to poverty. It is related to a certain kind of human perversion, which is global. And uh, somewhere we have kind of normalized it. Somewhere we have got so comfortably used to it and we, we really don't want to change it. It, it kind of makes us feel very comfortable in a silent global world, uh, which makes all the right noises, but doesn't do the right action to end it. And that is why human trafficking is growing every day. You just described that both developed and poor countries are engaged in this, and there's supply and demand all over that global supply chain. How do you stop it? Where are the pressure points? I think one of the major things that we need to look at is ending demand for this. Demand reduction, perhaps, is one of the only things that can end this problem, because you work on the supply part you know, as so long as the demand is there, the supply will be generated from this way or that way. And and when you when you look at human trafficking, especially from the sex trafficking spectrum, and from that lens, then you're talking about men and male desires, uh, which has uh, which has been the core reason for uh, uh, this whole demand generation, which is further supported by. Uh, poor legislations, poor implementations of law, poor implementation of the criminal justice system, especially on this issue. Just for a common understanding, it is it is considered as an $858 billion industry as per some estimates. And it is the second largest organized crime uh, next to drugs and arms. So we're talking about huge thing that is actually the demand and the supply rests on the vulnerability of human minds. So at one end, if you look at the male demand, is one vulnerability of the male race, meaning what makes them, uh, you know, the, the, the reason for creating this demand. At another end, at, at the supply end, you look at economic desperation and a whole lot of vulnerability, social, cultural vulnerability becoming the reason for them being available. So, uh, uh, but if you have to get some real answers and if you want to really change this, I think if you don't pick at the demand, you can never change it. So demand is the core of the problem. How has the coronavirus pandemic affected demand? For the first two months when we, we had 
a huge amount of big lockdowns in India. Um, and, you know, the entire movement was stopped. Uh, the entire currency and the entire exchange of transaction came to a standstill. So did human trafficking for a little while. Of course, the pandemic will, will end in a lot, lot, lot more women and children being sold again because that's the kind of economic devastation that we are seeing now. But once the money flow could be cut, that did really bring in some kind of a, a sudden stop, standstill. And I think that is where we need to recognize that, you know, uh, demand reduction and end of demand could be one way of tackling this problem. So who should do what to reduce the demand for human trafficking? I think one of the things that we need to recognize that this is a global problem, but the solutions have to be local. Every country has its own unique problem related to human trafficking. What happens in the United States of America is different from what happens in India. India has its own, own dimensions of human trafficking. And therefore, in, for a country like India, perhaps, what is required is um, to create legislation, comprehensive legislation, um, to both end demand and you know, plug in the supplies, because we have neither of that at this moment. Where the kind of legislations that we have, first of all, it is slightly weak, but even the weak legislation is not really implemented. So the answers are local. The problem is global. As you talk, you could be describing climate change. As you talk, the, it's clear that there are parallels. They're both global. Uh, they're both invisible to most people. Both are incredibly destructive of human life. Both require local action to serve the common global good. And more or less, both are not being addressed in serious ways, but are getting worse and worse and worse, faster and faster. I'm incredibly pessimistic that we're, as a planet, smart enough to get a hold of climate change fast fast as the problem demands. Why should I be more optimistic that we will get coordinated global action when it comes to human trafficking? I think human trafficking should really scare us a lot because at least the climate, you will take a little time to get aware of it, you know, and uh, you will get a little more time to become mindful of what is happening to your trees and your water and your air and your things. But when you lose your children, and there will be no children in your country, and half the humanity is getting wiped out every minute, it's humanity getting wiped out in slavery and exploitation, you will you'll see it. You'll feel it. It will pinch you very hard. You're losing national resource. You're losing human resource to slavery. Can you imagine that in the last three months, there has been something like 40 million child sexually abusive material that has been generated from India during this lockdown period. Ultimately, ultimately, this is a moral issue. In the 19th century, there were big reactions against slavery in England, in the United States, in many countries. William Wilberforce uh, famously campaigns in England to end slavery, put quotes in the word end. Fast forward to the 21st century, slavery still persists. You've described it as a big business getting bigger every day. It is still a huge moral issue. Where does the moral leadership come from in the 21st century to end trafficking? I think we have lost faith in our political leaders. We have lost faith in, in people who are supposed to be our rulers. I don't think they represent the, the moral quotient for us, which was there once upon a time. We looked up to our leaders. We said, okay, Mahatma Gandhi or things like that. You know, they kind of gave us the alternative. They, they, dis, they uh, created a path of, of uh, alternatives. Today, I think we have to invoke the leadership within us to bring change. We have to 
we have to become the change agent. And uh, expecting anybody else to do it, I'm sorry, it's not going to work out. I think if each one of us have to take the responsibility and we become the moral bank for the for the communities that we stand for, we we have to take a call that we will not give up. Each one of us as human beings who still think right, who who still believe that slavery and exploitation is not acceptable, it's not tolerable. Each one of us has to take that leadership. I don't think it's it's gone too far. I don't I don't know about your country, but in my country, I don't see anything where where it can come from. And uh, one has to hold on to our own spirituality, our own sense of rightness, and keep continuing to you know flag the the unheard voices and ensure that we don't give up morally. Let's go from the global to the local. You work in Hyperbod India. You founded an amazing organization, Prajwala. Could you talk, Suni, just a little bit about the organization, about the facts on the ground in your community, uh, what you're seeing, what you're doing, what's getting better, what's getting worse? Uh, Prajwala is uh, is uh, one of the most uh, pioneering organizations in, in India working on the issue of uh, sex trafficking and sex crimes. Uh, we've been here for the last two and a half decades and more. And um, what we have been able to do is uh, remove from exploitation more than 23,000 women and children. And um, being able to demonstrate to, to our country and in our own space uh, what is possible. Because, uh, you know, we we grew up with, uh, with um, uh, you know, uh, stories and uh, books, you know, in our social studies, we had, you know, some things are inevitable reality of this humanity. You know, you cannot change this. So one of the things was commercial sexual exploitation of women and children is a necessary evil in this country. Yeah. And uh, we in Prajwala, we have been able to break that myth and break that stereotype and say, no, it is not a necessary evil. We can change it. We're talking about officially around two to three million women and children that's um, uh, who are enslaved in in prostitution, um, but the actual fig- figures could be around eighteen million. Forty five percent are children, uh, and when I say children, the youngest child that I have had the misfortune of rescuing is around three and a half years old. So we're talking about very very little children who are sold. For the for satisfying the desires of some man somewhere, uh, so uh, the the problem is is huge. Um, uh, also, because it is not just uh, you know a, a world of economics and crime that you're dealing with. You're also dealing with a whole world of socio cultural practices. There are communities that sanction this form of slavery. There are communities who believe that their children should be inducted into this because this is what is the community livelihood is, or this is the community trade. So if you're dealing with several layers of problem, um, combined with, of course, the economic deprivation and the uh, social cultural exclusion of huge number of below poverty line individuals. So it's in this context that we are we are we are located. Uh, so Prajwala has been at the forefront of trying to prevent the problem. We have been uh, involved in several movements, and one of the large movements that we have initiated is MAD, Men Against Demand, where we have, um, you know, awakened um, more than uh, hundred thousand men to become the voice to end sex slavery in this country. Uh, that apart, we, we've been going around creating community vigilance, creating communities of very vigilant people who, who help their own communities to prevent trafficking in their own areas. Um, but the fact of the matter is every day there are so many girls who are sold. And every day um, somebody has to remove them from there. And so we work with the police, we work very closely with the enforcement agencies, work with them to remove uh, young women, children out of sex slavery, and then 
create a whole world of therapeutic communities, uh, a safe space for people to recover, recoup, and heal themselves and get back a life with dignity. Suni, obviously, the pandemic has ha- has impacted everybody, everybody everywhere. What do you think will change for you, for Prajwala, after the pandemic finally begins to ease, finally begins to pass? The problem is going to become very big. It's already become very big. Um, the vulnerability of children in this time has increased hundredfold, especially on the cyber sex trafficking zone. So um, online sexual exploitation of children has increased hundredfold during the pandemic. And as it eases down, it's going to go. That's more more invisible and more difficult to deal with. We are not even able to deal with the surface problem. How are we going to deal with the virtual problem? But that apart, these, the levels of poverty that we are going to see now with the huge amount of economic devastation, in the last few days, the only kind of cases that I'm dealing with are families selling off their children repeatedly. And that's going to increase hugely. That apart, as an organization, we are going to go, go through huge funding challenges because everybody has become poorer. The richer also become poorer. So I think there will be very less people to even donate, to reach out to uh, humanitarian works like ours. Just, you know, the kind of work that we do, we run huge safe spaces for these children. And during this pandemic time, and as it's, I don't know how we're going to deal with the whole situation. We are kind of living with a whole new normal. We have to set up quarantine facilities in our shelters. Uh, you know, it's become so resource intensive. Um, all of us are reaching burnout right now because every day has become very stressful. Uh, you don't know from where you can get infected. And uh, the, the public health system uh, in India is the most neglected space. Uh, so apart from the fact that there are no beds, there are no doctors because many of them have got infected. So we're going to see a very, very scary space, especially we have in our safe spaces more than one third of, of them who are severely human, immune compromised, living with HIV AIDS. Um, that's one of the collateral damages that you find in sex slavery that you get infected with several diseases and one of them being HIV AIDS. So I have five-year-olds and 10-year-olds who are HIV positive and uh, keeping them safe from getting infected again is another world of challenge that all of us are going to face now. Um, I can only say it's not going to be an easy time now or the coming years. Suni, you're one of my heroes, as I think you know. How do you get up every day? How do you cope with really incredibly difficult circumstances, that, and each one of which is a human life that, that is potentially wasted? I've said this many times before also, Alan, but, um, and I'll say this again, the, the smiles and the sense of contentment that you get when you see somebody has regained back herself and is now able to face the world and live, live with a very, very screwed up world of human beings um, is something like a miracle that I see every day. You know, and I, it amazes me how these young children, young women, you know, regain back their trust in humanity. And uh, and I know I cannot afford to be cynical. And I, I know that I can't afford to give up because they have not given up on me. You know, and so how, how can we give up on humanity? Because, uh, but I, I wish definitely, Alan, today more than ever, that uh, I, I wish things were better. It is, it's a strange sense of um, claustrophobia that I'm going through right now. And one of the things during this pandemic is 
how long, how much more long that we need to be doing what we are doing. That's something that's kind of plagued me. I don't like that uh, sense of discomfort that it gives me. Um, a certain kind of darkness that envelops me both locally and globally. And uh, finally, you see those little sense of oneness only within you and inside you. And we have, one has to constantly bank on that reserve. Well, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for today's conversation. And let's hope that not just that you continue, let's hope instead that you don't have to continue someday, that you are successful. I do hope. Um, that's the only goal I have, to close shop. I, I want to have one day when I can sleep properly uh, and say, okay, no child, no girl, woman, no human being is being exploited anywhere in the world. And uh, there is not requirement for a Sunita Krishna or any Prajwalas to be born again. That's the world I'm waiting for. Well, I hope you succeed in working yourself out of business. That would be a better world. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the New Thinking for a New World podcast. We welcome your comments and please subscribe to other episodes in the podcast app of your choice. This podcast was made possible with the generous support of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation.